Uh, so firstly, thank you for the invitation and thank you to Helen and Jens for being such good hosts. Um, I just want to start by outlining the kind of philosophy that goes behind all of my work, all of which you're about to see. Um, and this is really the idea that you know, we live in a society where we share languages, I mean, obviously the spoken language, but also a language of signs and symbols. But because we are divided within society into classes and different groups, we struggle over the meaning of what those signs and symbols mean all the time. Um, and the key point about this is, is in times of revolutionary and social crisis, that struggle becomes much, much more apparent. I'm going to sort of show some examples of that. Now, the, um, the key other aspect to, to this is that the ruling class strives to try and contain the kind of meanings, like you know, again, I was talking about the media, the media, the media tries to contain the narrative. And we try and break things open as a public. We try and break open the means, create new meanings, new forms, and new types of society eventually. So that's kind of what I see my work as doing. This is an example of, uh, from Britain of a tweet that was sent out by the Conservative government, the ruling party, um, uh, at the budget time. And I, hope, I know it's a very English example, but I hope you can understand this. So this to me is an example of the ruling class in Britain, both patronising the working class, but also trying to contain the working class. So you see, what they did in the budget was they cut the cost of beer, and they cut the cost of bingo. And they put out this very, well, I mean, it shows how touched they are, because they obviously thought this would play with the working class. So we're cutting the bingo tax and the beer duty, right? So that goes out into the social networks. What intrigues me, and what I'm really interested in, actually, is the way the social media says making this struggle really apparent. And within 20 minutes, people were responding with things like this. And because everyone's got computers, everyone's got Photoshop, they're able to do it in a visual way. So they fight with images as much as they fight with words. So here, you see someone's found a quote from George Orwell's 1984 about controlling the, the working class. Here's another example, a kind of more direct one. Um, and it's just put these work there safely out. And, and it's important to understand what's happening in England. England, is, despite being the sixth richest country in the world, and despite the fact that the crisis has been ameliorated by the, all the quantitative easing, we've got £1.6 trillion pounds into the city of London to prop it up. We have millions of people relying on food banks. We have millions of people who can't, uh, who are in work but living in poverty, and have, and have essentially get benefits from the government to help them with their rent and their wages. So kind of form of corporate welfare. There's enormous enormous amounts of homeless, you know, it's not kind of going well in Britain at all. <clears throat> to kind of go a little bit further back, and so I've been involved in social political movements for about 20 years. And so this is also for me very important. My work sometimes goes into galleries and big institutions like we've just heard. But for me, the real crucial thing is the relationship between creativity and social political movements and the role that creativity plays in social political movements. It's a very different role where it's a it brings a particular thing to movements that speeches and rallies and demonstrations don't. It doesn't mean you don't need those things, but it's the way that it can... It can... Because artists and designers reimagine the world when they do their work, that reimagining of the world, that kind of trying to investigate what, what life could be, is a really important thing, particularly when we're kind of fighting against people like fascists and racists that want to kind of, again, pull us backwards. So this is a poster I did for the demonstration against the G8 in Genoa, a very big moment in 2001 for the anti-capitalist movement. I was very heavily involved in that, in organising that. In 2003, I worked with a publisher um, uh, to sub subvert these cards that were brought out by the US military in the, the start of the Iraq war. They gave these to the soldiers for the people that they wanted picked up, Iraqi most wanted playing cards. So we did Regime James Begins at Home playing cards. So we picked all the people that we think, all the heads of governments, all the arms dealers, all the heads of corporations, and we make a pack of cards. Now, these sold 30,000 copies around the world. And I'm not saying that to show off, although I am showing off, because I'm not really good. Um, but, you know, 30,000 people, you know, and to me, this is important as well. It's about affirming these feelings that people have that don't necessarily come out into the open. You know, it's not about preaching to be converted. I think that's a real nonsense kind of idea. You know, it's important for us to affirm feelings that are hidden or anger that's hidden and comes out. And the fact that they sold so many, and that, to me, sort of acknowledges that, that kind of people thought that war was very wrong, and obviously Britain, you yeah, have two million people on the streets. I also make lots of posters, and again, to me, the humour, and again, kind of thinking about what new aesthetics means in the 21st century. The left, in terms of its aesthetics, often looks back to the Russian Revolution, or May 68 in France, or things like that, because they were the high points of struggle in the past. But we need to look forward, and we need to think about, things need to look like they're part of the society that they are now. And these are two more examples of these posters. Now, the thing is, again, I don't just do these posters and uh, people buy them or whatever. They're also integrated into the struggles. So this is the poster to put up with, I make this sort of slogan tape as well. These were put up at Occupy in London when the camp happened outside 
the stock exchange there three years ago. This is a larger form of, form of posters that were put up on the banks that trade in uh, atmospheric pollution. Uh, because in 2009, when the G20 came to London, we occupied this street, which is in the city of London, and that, that building, sort of the grey building in the back, is where, say, people are trading in pollution with the same kind of Ponzi schemes that have brought down the world economy. The banner, which you can't, maybe can't quite see, says nature doesn't do bailouts. And we occupied that road for a whole day until the police came in with dogs and cleared us and were quite violent and aggressive. So in that demonstration, and like I do in lots of other things, we, we used the tape to kind of decorate the streets. Again, the point about this is not just to crucify the demonstration, it's to get people into debate about the politics and what's going on, it's kind of a way to stop people and have a conversation. The slogan tape gets taken up by people in all sorts of weird ways. This is a young girl that was on the demonstration that really wanted me to put this Another World is Possible tape around her fake Chanel bag. I like the kind of, kind of, again, the kind of contradictions there, but again, it's kind of like thinking about how you kind of bring out the feelings of people into the open. George Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister at this time, so he's being controlled by the banks, and this is being put over the, the maps of the City of London. I've gone abroad to places like the World Climate, uh, the climate what's it, the World Summit for Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth in Bolivia. So here we were working and talking around with like, all the indigenous groups that were mobilized by Evo Morales after the Copenhagen summit in 2009 went down. Very interesting again to kind of get into the debates with them. So, you know, all the problems all around the world are the same, really. It's very interesting in that sense. And so then it talks about a kind of curatorial aspect to it. So in 2009, we did this show called Signs of a Revolt, which looked at all the kind of uh, creativity that happened within the movements in the last 10 years. Then in 2011, when the Occupy camp happened in London, um, we set up Occupy Design. So a bunch of us, so the collective is still going. We're going to be doing some stuff for the climate summit in Paris in December. It's the kind of big project we're working on at the moment. Um, and we work with other groups. So we work with other activist groups. So this is a group in the UK called UK on Cut, which is an anti-cuts group. And it's been very successful. What it does is it, it takes over high street shops. So it takes over the everyday high street and occupies the shops who are all avoiding their tax. We've got loads of corporations in England, or nearly all of them actually, we don't pay any tax at all. So Starbucks, for instance, have not paid any tax in Britain since 2009. So, because the cuts in Britain, 70% of the cuts affect women's income. We, uh, women occupy the Starbucks and turn them into creches and refuges and all the things that are being cut. Now, the problem with this is it's great for the people occupying the shops. They're all in there having kind of discussions and whatever. But the ordinary people down the street don't really know what's going on. There's, there'll be police outside that, you know, they're in trouble or something. So as Occupy Design, we make those big posters for this action. It means the message gets out in the media. So it's our way of, even if the media, when the media report on this, or if you do a Google image search on this, you see all these posters say what the demonstration is about. And it's a way of hijacking the media uh, space. So even if the media report on this and say it's all full of smelly hippies occupying Starbucks, the actual image says what it's about. So this one says, you know, cost of corporate tax avoidance in the UK, 70 billion. The benefit cuts so far have been 15 million. So just like you were saying, with the government has very cleverly turned the narrative around to say it's the social welfare system that is the problem, not the banks. Again, I kind of like to work on large scale. You'll see in the exhibition, this is an example of that. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was able to work with the largest sky projector in Europe, and we worked in Linz in Austria. And this was a piece I did on the Shell Garage sign. So and that obviously wasn't part of the movement, but then. In two years ago, I went to Havana. I got invited out to make a mural on the side of the University of Havana. So this is eight meters high, this mural. And this was called Occupy Havana. So this was a, uh, the idea with this was, it came out of a workshop with 10 other artists. And the idea with this was it was a gift to Occupy from Cuba to the world. And the monster is capitalism. He's being pulled down by the 99%. He's devouring the world. And on the, of the, all the hairs of his body are corporate stock figures taken from the Financial Times as we were doing the mural. And then the other thing that we're doing with Occupy Design, as I said, you've got all these amazing images being pumped out of the social networks and being, and kind of since being uh, expanded in a sense by the way they go through the networks and being viral and whatever. So one of the things that we're doing is we're collecting all of that imagery and putting it up on our site, so this is an example of this. Um, and this is because uh, we don't want it in the corporate space. Obviously when it's on Facebook or Twitter, they can take that down, you know. So we're kind of trying to archive all of this kind of work, and I'll give you the website address for this, and you can have a look. 
other examples. So I also work in publishing, so I'll talk about the book at the end. Uh, this was a Spanish magazine called Malababa. In Spanish, that means kind of a spit in your face, kind of idea of a slap in the face. It's like slang. Uh, this was a culture jamming magazine, a kind of anti-advertising magazine, uh, a kind of what the city could be like kind of magazine. Uh, these are kind of spreads from that. Um, again, kind of uh, outlining sort of projects around the world that people are doing in terms of intervening in urban space. <clears throat> Then two years ago, no, three years ago, no, four years ago now, sorry, uh, it was going, time was going so quickly, we had the big student revolts in Britain. So the British the coalition government, which although it's a coalition, is essentially a hard right conservative government. The liberals pretend that they're kind of tempering the kind of right wingness of the conservatives, but they're not at all. Um, and so one of the things, as you probably know, is that the conservative government brought in tuition fees of £9,000 a year. So that means if you're a student in Britain, along with the loans you have to take to live on, we're having to spend nearly £20,000 a year just to get your degree, the most expensive in Europe, and that's 20 years ago, it was completely free. So the, just, there was a, a run of demonstrations from, from students, mainly in London, but all over the country as well, occupying their colleges. And this was talked about in this book by Verso called Springtime, The New Student Rebellions. And so what I did here was we, we narrate, we visually did a visual essay of the demonstrations. So, this one here, there was a big demonstration outside the Conservative HQ where the students occupied it and went onto the roof and caused lots of trouble. One of the students was a bit stupid and threw a fire extinguisher off the roof, which is why there's a fire extinguisher here. What you're seeing, which you can't quite read, are all the tweets that were happening at the time that kind of say what's going on. The second demonstration happened with school kids and kids who were in college before university. Uh, in England, what the police do is they call it kettling which is basically where instead of tear gassing you or beating you up, they just lock you in a space for, for hours and hours and hours and won't let you out. So they locked loads of 16 and 17 year olds in Whitehall outside number 10, the whole day in the freezing cold, with all of their mothers and fathers really worrying and that's what's on all these streets here. And then the police deliberately left the police van in the middle of the demonstration, which of course then the kids smashed up and then immediately hits the picture that it wants to get of the violent demonstrations. And so that's what the police van is about. So you see there the twist. And then as, it, as it's a kettle, there's the kettle there. And in the steam, that's a tweet from the Metropolitan Police, which said, the, they say things like, we would like to facilitate your peaceful protest. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a, um, that. So other kind of publications, as I say, we did, uh, we formed Occupy Designs, a collective out of the camp in London. And, that, and, we formed, and we made the Occupy Times, which initially was a paper to tell people about what's going on in the camp. And has now become like a bi-monthly magazine, which I would say kind of expresses the young kind of precariat that there are, you know, the kind of fact that most people in London who are young have got precarious jobs, precarious income, it expresses their kind of thoughts, also interesting writers. In the camp, that was put together collectively in the camp. Um, I did a poster for that that went, that went into the thing as a, as a present for everybody. You see that going into the paper here. The, so this is not just my work, this is collective stuff. So, on the back of every uh, uh, occupied times, there's a poster. So this is some examples of the, of the posters that we had. You'll see the themes are very familiar. This was one for <coughs> Strike Debt, which is a campaign in America where they're paying off student debts. Occupiers paying off people's student debts for the a kind of rolling jubilee. This is a quote, this is another one, another Occupy Times back page, it's a quote from Aaron Schwartz, who was one of the founders of Reddit, who killed himself recently because he was being pursued by the American government for releasing uh, uh, files from a library. A big advocate of sharing, it says sharing isn't immoral, it's a moral imperative, and I think that in a sense sums up the struggle that we have in the 20th century. Again, it's kind of what I'm trying to, I suppose, emphasize, this is again, it's kind of the aesthetic is modern, it's contemporary, it uses, uh, you can see here the USB symbol and things like this, so it references to networking, you know, it doesn't look like 1917 and whatever. Oh, well, actually, this is a better example of the Occupy graphic, I have two slides and so just start moving. So this is an example, so this is stuff I collect all the time. It's from all over the world, it's on the Occupy theme, or it's about things that 1% are doing. And you can just see, and again, obviously, to me, what's interesting is this, there's no one aesthetic, there's all sorts of aesthetics, so it's not that we're trying to find one that will define the movement. Um, and it just, uh, to me, it's just an example of the everyday creativity of people. It's incredible. 
and, the, and again, the social networks really kind of make that really, really visible. So you can, like I say, I'll give you the website for this, you can look at this later. Um, I've actually got a lot of stuff from Hong Kong, there's some amazing pictures you can have there. And let's just move on to the show, so the kind of stuff I've been working up and doing for Greg and Oliver. So, um, when they approached me and asked me to, to design the book, um, I thought about what, how I could do it. We wanted to kind of do it as a, a very nice book that kind of would have the feel of an art book, uh, even though it's kind of a very much a book you, you read and full of essays. Um, and then obviously just the show, it's kind of like a hybrid kind of show catalog, essay, um, yeah, hybrid. Um, so the kind of theme of it was to look at the stock markets. So um, in the book, the, the opening titles of every essay have these kind of patterns. And I say these are all drawn from gold, the movements of Goldman Sachs stock market figures as I was making the book. So I captured the screen from the stock market things then redraw them and kind of slightly abstract them. You can't quite see here, but there's an underlying grid on all the pages that's meant to reference again the kind of idea of the stock market. The colors are meant to reference the colors of the screen monitors, red, green, and blue. And the idea here really is that the, these abstractions, which, which even the people in the towers in Canary Wharf obviously don't control, dominate us. You know, I mean, Marx talked about how capitalism and abstraction that dominates us at a worldwide level. It's not even, it's not just about what your labor's worth, it's about what the average labor worth is around the world, so dominate by this abstraction all the time. And obviously across Europe, that's what we have. We have a, a situation where most of the politicians have agreed that money is import, more important than people. You know, we have people committing suicide in Britain, as they do as they are in Greece over these things, you know, it's that kind of serious. Um, and yet, you know, in Britain, the thousand richest pre people, sorry, yeah, the, th no, the hundred richest people, I've got, no, sorry, the thousand richest people have got 200 billion pounds richer than the crisis. Now, we have more billionaires now in London than we have ever had before. So it's not the case that money's not there, I'm just saying it's the fact that um, other people are being blamed like immigrants. So these kind of patterns kind of go throughout the book, and it's kind of, like I say, it's mental kind of reference to the stock market. The cover is an image of traders uh, from a trading floor, all kind of being aggressive and very macho shouting into their phones, buy, sell, whatever it is they're saying, and then having money rain down on them. Because again, that's obviously what's happened. I told you that, say, 1.6 trillion has been given by the British government to the city of London. But the American government has given $16 trillion to the world banking system. They actually bailed out Deutsche Bank when the crisis happened. And not a lot of people know, but I know a, a journalist in, in London who talks to the bank managers, and in 2008, the cash machines in London, or cash machines in Britain, we're two days away from running dry. There's no money left. And Gordon Brown gave a secret £60 billion loan to the banks to keep the system going. So we almost had our Argentina in 2008, but it's been staved off at the moment, Well, I think another crisis is coming. And so just finally, the um, piece that's in the show, which I hope you'll see later, for real, um, is this piece. It's called the We Are The 1%. .1%. Oliver asked me to make a piece for the show in Belgrade. You saw, we had a long sort of seven metre space. So this is actually designed six metres by three metres, it's three metres by two in the show here. And it's a demonstration of the 1%, or it's a demonstration of the politicians on behalf of the 1%. So in the back, you have the European Central Bank with the banner that says, we are the 1% hung from it. You have them protecting money. You have the politicians in various, uh, their, their respective right police uniforms with corporate logos on them to kind of emphasise the kind of corporate power relationship. And apart from the money and the fire, all of the images are taken from anti-austerity demonstrations. So all of the images of the police are pieced together, there's about 200 images I've pieced together to make this montage, uh, that are from demonstrations in Spain, demonstrations in Greece, demonstrations in Italy. You know. So it kind of, again, it's about um, drawing things from the real world and obviously doing what political montage does, which is by bringing those elements together, you create different meanings and new understandings of the world. So hopefully you'll enjoy the piece in the show. And, you, and again, you'll see the exhibition design kind of reflects the stock market graphs uh, in, in the book as well. <laughs> <laughs>